Good evening all and welcome to this evening's full council meeting. I'm Councillor Maureen Cregan, Mayor of Warrington, and I will be chairing this meeting. Before I start my initial comments, could all mute your microphones or phones until you are asked to speak. In order to mute yourself, please press star six. When you are invited to speak, please unmute by pressing star six again and turn your camera on. Due to the current coronavirus pandemic, the Council have taken steps to follow instructions and health guidance in a relation to self-isolation and social distancing while, whilst fulfilling our duties as Council. The meeting is being broadcast live to the public in line with the requirements of the Co Coronavirus Act 2020, Section 78. I will now call on each councillor's name alphabetically to determine if they are present and I will state if they have sent apologies. I understand Councillor Wheeler may be joining the call later on. <laughs> Councillor Abbey? Here. Yeah. Councillor Axel? Present. Councillor Barr? Present. Councillor Bates. Present. Councillor Biggin. Here, Miss. Councillor Bowden. Present, Madam Mayor. Councillor Buckley. Councillor Carey. Present. Councillor Carter. Present. Councillor Cooksey. Councillor Davidson. Oh. Councillor Deira. Present. Councillor Fellows. Ma Madam Mayor. Yes. Madam Mayor. Uh, it's Councillor Higgins here. Uh, Councillor Fellows has sent a message to me that he's trying to dial it in. Right, we are, Councillor Higgins. Thank you. I'll take a note of that. <laughs> Um, Councillor Council Fitzsimmons. Present. Councillor Flarty. Present. Councillor Flatley. Councillor Friend. Present. And G and Councillor G Friend. Uh, present, Madam Mayor. Councillor Froggett. Councillor Grime. Present. Councillor Guthrie. Present. Councillor Hall. Present. Councillor Hannon. Councillor Harris. Present, Madam Mayor. Councillor Hart. Present. Councillor Higgins. Yes, we Present, have Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Hill. Present. Councillor Jennings. Present. Councillor Johnson. Present. Councillor Keane. Present. Councillor Ke Brown. Present. <coughs> Councillor King. Can, uh, can I just say Councillor Buckley is present by telephone? Yes, we'll do. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knowles. Present. Councillor Krisniak. Oh, he's sent apologies. Thank you. Um, Councillor Marr, we have apologies for him. Councillor Marks? Present. Councillor McCarthy? Present. Councillor McLaughlin? Present. Councillor Mitchell? Present. Councillor Morgan? Present, Madam Mayor. Councillor Morris? Present. Councillor Mundry? Present. And Councillor Karen Mundry? Present. Councillor Parrish? Present. Councillor Price? Councillor Smith? Matt Smith? Yes. Councillor Tarr? Present. Councillor Walker? Here. Yeah. Councillor Warburton? 
Present. Councillor Williams. Present. Councillor Pat Wright. Present. And Councillor Steve Wright. Present. Thank you. Hello, uh, Councillor Fellows is here now, sorry. Yeah. Can, can, can I, get, I have email to say that I can't get on Teams. Is Councillor Kath Buckley here? Oh, right, Kathy. I can't get on Teams anywhere. What, right. Nothing will let me on. Okay. Right, we are. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Kath. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, apologies have been received from Councillors Krizniak, Ma, Fennell. We have Patel, Wellborn, and Councillor Wheeler will be in later. The minutes of the Council. I will move the minutes of the Council meetings held on the Monday, the 2nd of November 2020. Does any member have any other matter of accuracy they wish to raise? Please indicate now. <clears throat> can I, can the Deputy Mayor please second? I'm seconding the minutes, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. I will take that as all members are voting in support of the minutes. Thank you. Um, item three, correspondence from previous minutes. Please note none have been received. Number four, code of conduct, declarations of interest, relevant authorities, disposable, pecuniary interests, regulations 2012. Do members wish to make any declarations of interest? No. Thank you, members. We're now taking question one as uh, from a member of the public. As detailed in the top up letter, we will be taking the one question received by the member of the public first. Welcome to you, Mr. Martland. Hello. Hello, Mr. Martland. Hello. You... Hello, Mr. Martland. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Would you like to yep. start, please? Yep. Um, so on the 1st of January next year, an inland border facility will open on the old shearing site in Appleton, Thorn. Now, this will process its estimated around 700 HGVs a day, almost all of whom will use the M56, M6 junction when arriving and leaving. The roundabouts and roads there are already congested and this is likely to get worse with a consequent increase in noise and air pollution. There are also planning applications for additional lorry facilities around the junction, such as expanding limb truck wash. And these will aggravate the situation further and seriously impact the lives of residents in the Lane End community. What measures are the council taking to manage this increase in traffic and particularly to monitor the additional pollution caused? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marplin. And can Councillor Mundry please respond? Yes, yeah, sure will, Madam Mayor. And thank you for the question, Mr. Martland. Mm -hmm. In late August 2020, the council was notified by HM Revenue and Customs that it intended to progress plans for the use of the former shearing Stretton interchange site in Warrington as an in inland border facility. The site would act as an office for, for, sta for sta starting and ending transport transit movements of goods to and from the UK on a roll on roll off vehicles from ports such as Haitian, Liverpool and Holyhead. It would include parking areas for heavy goods vehicles and other vehicles, as well as the security measures and facilities to enable the check-in of vehicles and goods entering and exiting the site. A special development order was laid in Parliament on the 3rd of September 2020, the Town and Country Planning Act and a special deployment order 2020 and came into force on the 24th of September. The legislation provided for granting of temporary approval to government departments to, to, provide, to provide facilities in special, special service local authorities areas and, the, and for the stationing of progressing of HGV entering and leaving the UK. 
It's also. Oh, sorry, is there somebody else speaking? Oh. It's also allowed the provision of associated temporary facilities and infrastructure. The legislation specifies that facilities will cease operation prior to the 31st of December 2025. Although in the case of Warrington, it has been confirmed that the site will operate only for a period of two years. Notwithstanding this, the legislation AHMR received C was were required to secure detailed approval, which they sought and then obtained uh, from the government office on the 23rd of November 2020. Under the requirements of the Special De Development Order, SDO, as part of the order making progress of a 14 day period, consultation pro of, en of enabling was, was undertaken where the comments were invited from the council and other statutory consultees. The council commented extensively on proposals and these were submitted to HMRC and the Planning in Inspectorate within a this 14 day period, which concluded on the end of October. The inland board facilities proposals are temporary and HMRC advise that they are designed to ensure no sufficient, no sufficient or long term environmental effects. HMRC reviewed the options for use of the site and special deployment development order to specify that the site is intended to operate from the 1st of January 2021 until the 31st of December 2022, 24 hours a day, seven days per week. The site has been selected for use as an inland border facility because of its close proximity to the M6, M56 motorways interchange, which provides access to the, the regional motorway network connecting the ports such as Liverpool, Asian and Holyhead. And I think transport and access issues. I can advise that the officers from both the council and as an highways authority for the local roads surrounding the site and officers from Highways England who are responsible for the management and operation of the motorways network surrounding Warrington have held extensive discussions with HMRC, the consultants representing them and the planning inspectorate in order to highlight to them the pre-existing pre issues of traffic congestion and concerns about the impact of up to 700 extra HGV vehicles per day accessing the site. Also to look to ensure that HGVs do not pass through Appleton Farm, where a 7.5 tonne weight limit is enforced to access the site. Given the very limited time available for these discussions to take place, which resulted from the limited notice the council was given of this application, these discussions are still ongoing at this time. However, officers have advised me of the following mitigation which have been agreed with HMRC. That an extensive number of uh, new road new road signs will be provided to cover all road access points to the site. These signs will direct all HGVs access to the site via M6 junction 20 only and not via the M56 Junction 10 and via Appleton Thorn. Signs will be installed by HMRC expense prior to the site becoming operation on the 1st of January 2021. The funding will provide HMRC for measures to monitor and mitigate the impact of the site on vehicle movements and from the site in particular heavy goods vehicles who ignore the 7.5 tonne weight limit in Appleton Thorn. The aim of this will to provide evidence to the police to undertake enforcement where required subject to, re to resources being available. It should be noted that the council alongside many other highways authorities across the country is campaigning for them to be given powers to enforce motor moving traffic offences via part six of the 2004 Transport Management Act, which highways authorities in London already have. Indications given by the Department for Transport suggest that this is under serious consideration and if this were to happen, the council would be able to apply for powers to enforce the weight limit in Appleton Farm. HMRC are required to follow provisions of the operational management plan and traffic management plan and have to produce for the site. This obliges them to provide information on usage of the site. The council will supplement this by, by monitoring by regular checking for changes in traffic flow at its permanent traffic counting site on Graffanol Lane. Councillor Mundry, could you pass the five minutes? OK, then what I will do is I yes. will ensure that a written, a full comprehensive written response 
it, it, it sent out to Mr Martland. Unfortunately, there's no short answer to this. It's something the council's not asked for. It's something that's been imposed on us by the government legislation. And it's something we have to try and make the best with, with what, what we've been given. Uh, we will I, be doing I, our I best. I understand that. Yeah. And I, we will, I ensure, that. I will ensure that a full, I will ensure that a full comprehensive uh, response is set out in writing to Mr Martland and to ensure that we, we are taking up our responsibilities. But a, a lot of the responsibilities at, at, at lie with the government and its legislation is put in place. Thank you, Councillor Mundy. Mr Martland, do you wish, do you have yes. a supplementary question? Um, uh, I understand, um, you know, what Councillor Mundy is saying. It's, it's not a situation of anyone's doing but the government's but mm -hmm. um, there have been you know development plans put forward for um, lorry facilities around that junction and traffic and pollution assessments have been done to inform those um, applications will those need to be redone in the light of the change in traffic uh, once that's you know it's becomes apparent what the the differences with the inland border facility traffic. Thank you. Councillor Mundry, please respond. Yes, yeah, it'll be a part of the written response. I didn't, I, it's, it's, it is on my response, we didn't get to it. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Mr Martland, you can now continue to watch the meeting via the live stream on the Council website, should you wish right. to do so. But thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Item five, which is not, is item not. <laughs> the mayor's announcements. Um, well, we've decided that the, the deputy mayor and myself have uh, taken up um, ringing round our care homes. Um, I did it as older person's champion earlier on in the year uh, of lockdown, and we felt that it was right to do it again. So we're working it as a team this time and um, we're doing very well so far. Um, thank you for your um, work, uh, Deputy Mayor, on this. Um, I've had the virtual meetings with the Youth Cabinet and also with the Warrington Youth Council. Um, we're getting to know them. I have a, a, another virtual meeting with them next week. Um, last um, week I met the grafters, the crafters, the crafters, uh, the crafters who have done the most beautiful tapestry outside the town hall. Um, if anybody gets a chance to look at it, um, it's absolutely stunning and it took up 3,600 pom-poms and then had to all be put together. So please come and have a look, look at that if you're passing. Now next week I'm um, in really happy about going on the site of our new uh, youth zone. I'll be so happy and I do hope that you, Councillor Carter, will be there. Uh, thank you very much. That's my announcements for this week. Announcements for from the leader now, please. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I circulated my announcements last week, um, so I'll take those as read and obviously yeah, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, for Councillor Bowden? Yes, please, Madam Mayor. Right, Councillor Barr, please carry on. Uh, I'm grateful to the leader for his announcement and I welcome and congratulate uh, both the officers and the cabinet members involved in the good town bid. That is clearly good news for us. We're not keen on the pork barrel of the town's fund. Uh, it is notable that it's gone predominantly to local authorities where a constituency was lost by Labour to the Conservatives. Nevertheless, in such hard times, uh, we welcome anything that we can get into Warrington. But this was a particularly good bid and I thought it was very well put together uh, in terms of the way that it responds to the town's very specific needs. Uh, so well done to everybody on that. 
Uh, I'd also like to recognise the circumstances under which leadership change has taken place at the Chamber of Commerce. Rather belatedly, I'd like to give my group's condolences to Colin Daniels' family and friends, but we look forward to uh, a new era uh, taking place there, and, and that's a welcome announcement uh, from, from the leader. Now, a couple of questions. Uh, we welcome the affordable and fair rent and discounted rent properties to be provided by the Council's new housing uh, company, Incrementum. Them. However, aren't we potentially making a mistake in concentrating so many families under financial stress on a single new estate? Could we have more? Uh, could we have an affordable housing policy which is more tenure blind and pepper pots families in need more evenly across the borough? And my final question. Um, is we really taking advantage of something the leader very kindly said. When he started public meetings, he said he'd answer any question from the public, and he then said he'd extend that courtesy to the council. Uh, so uh, I'd be grateful that the leader could give me uh, some details of the circumstances surrounding the involvement of the police in the aftermath of the un uh, unofficial remembrance event, allegedly contrary to COVID-19 regulations, that took place in the town centre, and in the case of two prolific social media posters. I've had correspondence and have seen comment on both on social media, and both are clearly controversial. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Barr. Councillor Bowden, would you like to respond, please? Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you to um, Councillor Barr. Um, firstly, I'm obviously grateful for um, Councillor Barr's comments regarding the town deal. Um, he's, he's absolutely right in terms of um, the quality of the bid, um, which, which was evident in the in the success in terms of the level of funding that was provided. And, you know, I think it's a, it would be remiss of me not to recognise the input that came from um, a wide cross section of people um, in from different areas within Warrington, you know, particularly in terms of uh, the business um, community. Of course, you know, having um, uh, oven ready, shovel ready, whatever phrase is in vogue currently, um, schemes to bring forward, um, recognise that a lot of this work had already been done by um, the council. And that's why we're able to go on the first tranche um, of funding. Um, and have obviously been successful. I, I totally agree with um, Councillor Barr in, in terms of his comments regarding the town deals fund um, and the very specific nature of, of those towns which are, uh, appear to have been put onto it. So um, uh, he's not going to have any argument from me on that. I think what's disappointing is that some of that funding now looks like it's been top sliced and has been uh, provided into a, a different scheme for infrastructure development um, more widely nationally. I think probably that's just going to be a drop in the ocean. I think the, the other part I would recognise is that the, the projects we put forward um, amounted to £26.2 million, um, whereas uh, the council received £22.1 million, a shortfall of some £4.1 million. So obviously we're going to have to look at the plans um, with the projects under those seven thematic themes uh, and look at you know what the implications of that are. But um, we've still obviously uh, got a lot of ambition. Um, it's disappointing that um, we have that shortfall. And I noticed that the person who's usually single-handedly claiming credit for every bit of funding the council gets has made no mention of the fact that on this case, we didn't get what um, we'd asked for. In terms of uh, affordable housing, I think, um, you know, the council is one player in the market and quite clearly we've got to have um, a strong policy drive and we, and we tried to do that through our draft local plan um, concerning getting the right mixture of homes in Warrington of varying tenure. And, you know, it's absolutely crucial that what we don't have is a market that delivers the wrong kind of homes for the people of Warrington and, and what need we have currently. Um, in this particular case, we've got a number of potential sites. Incrementum is starting on those first two um, in Birchwood um, and over at Great Sankey. Um, and so, you know, I don't think it's a case of um, we just provide, you know, shoehorning people into a particular site. That's uh, around 160 properties um, over those two sites, um, which is a modest start for, for Incrementum and to be welcomed. And actually the quality of those homes, particularly around um, green energy, um, use of solar panels, uh, ground source heat pumps, all those kind of things, hopefully will be the benchmark of what the market can provide uh, in terms of uh, quality ho um, homes for Warrington people. Um, on, the other, on the other two matters, um, I, I think I've been uh, fairly clear um, regarding 
the, the circumstances around uh, Remembrance Sunday. What seems to be totally missed in the, the usual kind of furore, you know, and uh, and uh, so on around social media and to some extent in our local media is that the council made a complaint to the police about the conduct of the police. The council did not make any complaint about the actions of residents of Warrington or members of the public who attended at the Cenotaph on, um, on, on that particular Sunday morning. I think that you know it's clear that people with um, good intent who are well-meaning uh, who wanted to pay their respects at the Cenotaph um, went ahead with a serve, you know, with an, an event uh, which looked very much like an official organised event that would normally have uh, on Remembrance Sunday. And the fact that the police were involved with that led to the police, uh, and there were police officers present, led to the council making a complaint to the police um, regarding their, um, their actions. I think at this stage, um, the police have issued a statement today. They have uh, prepared a report. Um, we do not uh, think that the evidence that's presented and the conclusions from that report, um, as, as come to by the police, uh, are coherent and make sense. Um, and on that basis, uh, the council is asking for a review of that report to be conducted by the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner. Make no mistake, at that time we were in lockdown. There were very clear uh, guidelines under the regulations um, concerning what events could be held. And the council made a very difficult decision to cancel the official event. It also cancelled the proposed substitute event at the parish church at St Elphins. And so therefore, you know, the, the actions of well-meaning people looked or certainly appear to have been outside of the regulations. And what we're most concerned about was the public health impact, bringing a large number of people together where it would be not possible to um, have track and trace and where unwittingly we could have uh, increased the number of cases locally in Warrington during a time of lockdown was of you know, the, the utmost concern to the council. And that's what has driven um, that particular complaint. I think in, in relation to the other item, um, I think the one person you haven't heard from is uh, is me in this matter. Yeah. And uh, not surprisingly, um, the other the other parties um, have been quite vocal. I, I don't really think um, I need to go into any specific detail, but to be clear, um, unwanted, unsolicited messages from people at all times of day and night, um, sometimes in the small hours of the morning, um, where you are being abused, uh, falsely accused of criminal acts, um, etc., are, to my, to my mind, unwelcome and potentially harassment. And on that basis, uh, I went to the police for advice after a period of some 16 months where I've received uh, hundreds and hundreds of messages. The fact that I've not responded to any of them should have been a clear sign to anybody who is rational and reasonable that the the actions that were being taken um, were not welcome and um, you know could be considered as intimidatory and, har and harassment. I would not have made any statement whatsoever in uh, in the pub in the public domain. I think anybody has a right to uh, privacy to protect their interests. Um, to protect the interests of their wider family. I can have the thickest skin in the world, um, but the impact on members of my family and my loved ones has been considerable. And at some point, whether I'm in the public eye or not, um, it's you know, that's not a choice that members of my family make. Um, and so in that sense, I sought to protect the interests of my family by seeking the advice of the police. Um, I would have kept that quiet. Um, I don't know why those two people felt the need um, to make that public knowledge particularly. Um, but anyway, we'll see what happens. What I wanted to avoid was needing to seek any kind of legal recourse. Um, but both both parties are now uh, on notice. Uh, I will not stand for bullying, harassment and intimidation. And uh, unfortunately, in the current social media age, 
people seem to think they can say and do what they like without any fear of recrimination. And I'm sorry, you know, I've drawn a line in the sand now uh, and I wish to move on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam. Can I just thank the leader for the, that statement? That's extremely helpful and I sympathise with it fully. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Barr. Uh, would anybody else like to speak? No. We'll go on to item seven. To receive reports from the Cabinet and the Council's committees. 7.1, 2020 to 2021 mid-year Treasury review. Councillor Fitzsimmons, can you propose the report? And Councillor Froggart, can you please second? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the Council formally uh, accepts the report from the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee in respect of the mid-year Treasury review. Thank you. Councillor Froggart. Councillor Fitzsimmons, is there anybody can second? Um, Councillor anyone Warbison. who's on the audit committee can speak yeah, up. Uh, uh, Councillor Warburton will second that uh, report. Thank you, Madam Thank Mayor. Thank you very Thanks much. Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do me, any members wish to speak to the report? Uh, yes, please, Madam Mayor. Councillor Marks. Yes, Councillor Marks. Please go okay, ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes, I just want to refer to paragraph 3.18, which says, and I quote, it is clear that HM Treasury will no longer allow local authorities to borrow money from the PWLB to purchase commercial property if the aim is solely to generate an income stream. So in future, to qualify for any PWLB loans, council finance directors, I understand, will be required to certify that there is no intention to buy investment assets primarily for yield at any point in the next three years. Now, the LGA says there is actually a danger that this will make it difficult for local authorities to continue to access PWLB borrowing to support service delivery, including housing and regeneration. Now, when I raised this concern at the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee, I was told it wasn't a problem because we could borrow money from other sources at comparable or even cheaper rates. Now, this may well be true, but I think it misses the point. Whether we like it or not, there is clearly concern in government about councils making purely commercial investments. <coughs> Therefore, for us to do this using money from elsewhere clearly goes against the spirit of government thinking and must be called into question. Now, I know what the response will be. The council has to make these investments to safeguard basic services. Now, we get this, which is why we've actually given you a fairly easy time on investments, particularly if they are within the town, linked to regeneration or energy saving. But we have repeatedly said there are some investments which we believe are too risky, despite all the due diligence, especially if they're out of area and in sectors nothing to do with what a council should be concerned about. So my question is, has this new ruling from the government caused the council to pause on any of its proposed investments? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Simmons, do you wish to respond? Indeed. Uh, I think what Councillor Marsh doesn't get is that this government, since it came in in 2010, has been determined that local authorities shall not succeed. And it, it, it's taken them a long time to work out that the, the Public Works Loan Board has been the, the source of our income. In, in fact, it is the government that controls the Public Works Board. Uh, it's taken them, uh, as I was saying, over 10 years to realise that it's their money that they're giving us. So they're a bit late in the day to ask what we're using it for. However, I take the point that the other, other sources of income uh, that are available to us, you're quite right, the government doesn't want to use those either. But the fact of the matter is all our investments go through the Treasury Management Board. So if you will, everything is on pause until such time as the Treasury Management Board gives it the green light. Uh, it's an all party uh, board, the, the Treasury Management Board. Uh, your party do have representatives on it. Um, and I'll leave it at that, but essentially, the government has been trying to do local government down, uh, and still is for that matter. Um, so I take your point, but no, we, we, we will continue to go ahead with our investment portfolio, as always, with a great deal of uh, scrutiny. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Councillor Fitzsimmons. 
the Chief Executive will now take the vote. We're voting on this. Yes, voting on this report, please. Take, so take the vote. Um, uh, Councillor Arby. Councillor Axel. Four. Councillor Barr. Four. Councillor Bate. Four. Councillor Biggin. Four. Councillor Bowden. Four. Councillor Buckley. She says she can't get Councillor it. Councillor Carey. Four. Councillor Carter. <laughs> Councillor Cooksey. Councillor Cregan. Four. Councillor Davidson. She's away. Councillor Durer. Four. Councillor Fellows. Four. Councillor Fitzsimmons. Four. Councillor Flaherty. Four. Councillor Fragley. Councillor Diane Friend. Four. Councillor Graham Friend. Four. Councillor Frogger. Councillor Grime. Four. Councillor Guthrie. Four. Councillor Hall. Four. Councillor Hannon. Four. Councillor Harris. Four. Councillor Hart. Four. Councillor Higgins. Four. Councillor Hill. Four. Councillor Jennings. Four. Councillor Johnson. Four. Councillor Keane. Four. Councillor Kerr Brown. Four. Councillor King. Four. Councillor Knowles. Four. Councillor Councillor Marks. Four. Councillor McCarthy. Four. Councillor McLaughlin. Four. Councillor Mitchell. Four. Councillor Morgan. Four. Councillor Morris. Four. Councillor Hans Mundry. Four. Councillor Karen Mundry. Four. Councillor Parrish. Four. Councillor Patel. Sorry, absent. Councillor Price. Councillor Smith. Four. Councillor Tart. Four. Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Warburton. Four. Councillor Wheeler, if you join us. Four, I am now. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Steve. Four. Yeah, thank you, Judith. Councillor Williams. Four. Councillor Pat Wright. Four. Councillor Steve Wright. Four. Thank you, members. Councillor Abbey, four as well, sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. I declare the report carried. Question nine. Re questions received from members of the council. Ten questions have been received. There are 30 minutes allocated to answering the questions. Any questions that have not been answered within this time scale will receive a written response. All questions will be taken as read. Question one. From Councillor Marks to Councillor Guthrie. Hello. Hello. Oh, sorry, my uh, microphone's going in and out. So if I break up, just let me know. All right. <laughs> okay. Sorry, sorry. I, 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 my, uh, I, I thought my question was first. This is Councillor Kath Buckley. I'm back in the meeting. I've had to go on the phone again. Your second, Kath. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Sorry. I've, I've, I've uh, re-phoned in because the Teams was broken down again. OK. Sorry. Thank you. OK. Yes, fine. Councillor Guthrie. Okay. Well, before I reply to your question, um, can the council join with me in thanking all our waste employees? We are so grateful for them keeping our three waste streams going through this difficult time. 
and also to thank all our residents who have continued to recycle despite everything that's happened recently. And going on to the question, our waste team are currently working on a number of projects in relation to recycling. One specific issue we are looking at is packaging and recycling symbols can be very confusing for both our residents, visitors and employees, as you outlined in your question. Elements of waste that can be recycled frequently change and alter dependent on the current market trends, market demands and operating procedures within the mixed recycling facility. This is operated by our third party contractors. So we work closely with our partners to maximise the level of recycled waste collected and processed by the council. Staff within the teams are currently working on a revised information leaflet that will be available via the council website as a download or in hard format early in the new year. And this is basically an update of the one everybody received um, during the past year. The information will clearly show that what we can and cannot recycle, including reference to the current symbols and signs displayed on packaging and support residents in increasing the levels of recycling currently achieved within the borough. Uh, residents also have the opportunity of recycling larger household items, either via our three community recycling centres or our third party, uh, third party partners changing lives in Warrington who operate our bulky waste collection service or many of the reused charities that operate within the town. I hope this answers your question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, Thank you, Councillor Guthrie. Uh, Councillor right. Marks, do you have a supplementary question? Um, yes, I do, a very brief one. Thank you very much, Councillor Guthrie. I'm very pleased to hear that, that clarification. Just on that subject though, on the, the 3rd of December from communications, I have it in front of me, a news release which talks about what well, the heading is Christmas bin collections. And further down it says some wrapping paper can't be recycled and I understand that. But then it says do the crunch, the scrunch test. And then it, if the paper doesn't spring back, it can't be recycled. Is that correct or should it actually be the other way around? If it doesn't spring back, it can be recycled. Am I being confused? I think you're being confused. If it doesn't spring back, it, you can't recycle it. Is that can, true? I don't think it, I think it is true. Um, I mean, what the councillor put on, I think it's, do, it's down to the metal content because some papers can have different contents. So it's actually sort of, that is a test that you can use. Sorry, I've got feedback, I can't. Yes, I know. Yeah. Sorry, Councillor Guthrie. Is that all right? Should we go on to the second one? Yeah. Question two from Councillor Buckley to Councillor Fitzsimmons. Can Councillor Fitzsimmons please respond? Thank you. Um, Good evening, Kath, and thank you for your question. Uh, can I ask that you bear with me because I am trying to read my own writing. So firstly, you're absolutely right that taxpayers should expect transparency in all government finances. As you know, an objection was lodged against the 2017-18 accounts that until these uh, are signed off, any later accounts cannot be finalised. The original complaint concerned Redwood Bank and that has now been resolved. However, during their inquiries, the external auditors identified some other issues which, in the spirit of openness and complete transparency, they felt should be pursued and possibly adjudicated upon. Their action is in total accord with their fiduciary and professional responsibilities. Unfortunately, due to COVID pressures, long-term illness and staff shortages, the auditors are unable to commit to a firm reporting deadline. At the last audit committee meeting, members did try uh, to obtain a deadline and express their frustration at the continuing delay. However, the auditors maintain their resolve. Therefore, on behalf of the committee, I must regretfully report that I cannot give any indication of when the outstanding accounts were received. I can say that once the 2017-18 accounts have been finalised, then I expect the 2018-19 and 2019-20 accounts to be resolved very shortly thereafter. 
hope that answers your question. Thank you, Councillor Fitzsimmons. Councillor Buckley, do you have a supplementary question? Carry on with question three uh, from Councillor Warburton to Councillor Mundry. Can Councillor Mundry, Mundry please respond? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Warburton, for your question. Um, early this year, the Council made a number of temporary changes to the road layout in the town centre as response to the COVID-19 pandemic. These schemes were funded through the government's Emergency Act Active Travel Fund and are designed to remove through traffic and encourage more people to walk and cycle. The schemes are fully consistent with the policies of the Council's fourth local transport plan, which we are encouraging to, to, to implement. A consultation is now underway, which proposes, proposes that a number of these changes are introduced on a permanent basis. Full, de full details of these proposals are set out in a comprehensive consultation leaflet. Within the leaflet, Full details are shown of the through routes which are routinely used by motorists to cut through the town centre, resulting in increased traffic volumes and speed, as well as the environmental impacts of noise, vehicle emissions. This makes the streets within the town centre much less attractive for people who live, work, and mean and, uh, uh, and mean to not to use friendly or unfriendly for pedestrians, cyclists, and others with disabilities. To propose permanent measures and intended to retain vehicle access for residents, visitors and businesses into the town centre areas. Reduce the volume of through traffic, which increases traffic flow and speed, creating a more attractive environment for all. Create road conditions for pedestrians and cyclists that are more attractive and will support the long term aims to promote greater levels of walking and cycling. In the longer term, the objective is to use these measures as as at the first steps towards a more comprehensive environmental enhancement scheme for the town centre, similar to the improvements seen in other towns and cities such as Frodham Street in Chester and Fishergate in Preston. As mentioned above, the intention is not to re restrict access to the town centre for those people who live, work or visit. It is to remove unnecessary through traffic to, to illustrate its plans. Plans are shown on the attached on the leaflet, highlighting how following the information of these measures, Traffic will be able to circulate the town centre and uh, full, de full details and uh, of how to respond to consultation will be set out on the government of the Warrington's government website. So it's www.warrington.gov.uk active travel consultation. So please look at that site. P please access the site and, and uh, take part in the consultation. And in brief, we're trying to make the town centre a more friendly place for people to visit and the through I'm trying to redirect the through traffic away from the town centre so people who aren't visiting our town don't need to go through the town centre. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Mundry. Councillor Warburton do you have a supplementary question? Not a supplementary question I think it's just um, to, to commend the council on the work that they're doing and um, I've had some comments from local residents regarding Bridgefoot particularly but I, I have also pointed them towards the direction of the consultation because um, all all comments will be taken into consideration with the final uh, the final plans. Well, thanks very much for your response. Thank you, Councillor Walton. Question four from Councillor Wheeler to Councillor Smith. Can Councillor Smith re please respond? I oh, will. Thank you. I'd like to thank Councillor Wheeler for the question. Um, members will be aware of the government back scheme to provide laptops and broadband access to disadvantaged children, which was launched during the first lockdown earlier in the year. This scheme was aimed at year 10 disadvantaged children. In the summer term, the council worked with schools to look at their requirements and estimated that the DfE provision left us about 400 laptops short when including other year groups. Councillor Bowden and I wrote to the Secretary of State about these concerns last summer. The council oversaw the provision of the laptops and broadband hotspot devices for families that needed them, ensuring that every eligible child had internet access for remote learning. After the summer, the scheme has changed so that laptops and 4G hotspots are now provided directly to schools rather than via the local authority. The scheme was broadened to cover more children in year groups 3 to 11 and any child who was shielding. 
Schools must now apply directly to the DfE when they have children who meet certain criteria, for example, those who are disadvantaged and self-isolating. The number of devices available to each school is determined by the DfE based on their own data. Unfortunately, earlier this term, the DfE slashed the number of laptops promised to schools by an average of 79%. This was announced via an email from the DfE to head teachers a few hours after schools closed for half term. At a time when the head teachers were hoping for a break following a very difficult half term, they had to go back to the drawing board and look again at remote learning provision for dis dis sorry, disadvantaged children. Again, we wrote to the Secretary of State to highlight our concerns. Over half of our maintained schools have applied to the DfE so far for a total of 383 laptops. A survey of our schools in early November indicates that our primary schools suggest they need more than 1,000 devices above the DfE allocations to ensure all their children can access remote learning. Some schools had difficulty getting their allocation of laptops and the local authority had to intervene to support them. Once the school receives their allocation of devices, then they are expected under the scheme to manage the collection and redistribution of laptops and hotspots to self-isolating students as required during the year. The challenge for our schools is managing this limited number of laptops in a way which ensures any disadvantaged child is able to keep up with remote learning. This comes on top of the ongoing challenges faced by our school leaders and teachers in terms of delivering learning in the safest possible way in school, providing remote learning for students at home, contact tracing for positive cases and so on. We received a reply from the Secretary of State to our first letter on the issue just two weeks ago. This response has been shared with head teachers and included an email address for schools to contact if they needed more devices. We've had no feedback so far on the outcome of any contact made by schools in response to this. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Wheeler, do you have a, any supplementary questions? Um, not a supplementary, not a supplementary, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Smith, for such um, a detailed response. But I think your um, your comments only go to confirm what we've heard from schools in Appleton, that the provision of the IT equipment has been patchy and has been a very hard task for teachers to sort of keep on top of it. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, I think what I would say about that really, I think the DfE over promised and under delivered on this scheme. I think they didn't really foresee the extent of the problem when they announced it and what was needed. Thank you. Madam Mayor, you're on mute. Are you asking me to speak? Sorry, Councillor McLaughlin. I'm all right now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, would you like to respond, please, Councillor McLaughlin? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for your question, Councillor Wheeler. The Council works continuously to support homeless people and secure accommodation for them. And at this time of year, when the weather's very cold, many people's thoughts are with homeless people and especially those who are rough sleeping. But for our homeless team, it is a year round issue that we work extremely hard to address and to prevent. So. I'm pleased to advise now that currently we have reduced sleeping, to rough sleeping to very low levels across the town. And at the end of November, it was just one a person. And the council offices are continuing to offer support to this person. But we are committed to preventing and relieving rough sleeping in Warrington as quickly as it happens. Housing Plus, um, which is our homelessness and housing advice service that we know as Housing Plus, is taking a proactive no second night out approach and this is working. We have three members of staff focused on rough sleeping and street outreach 
and they walk the streets a couple of times every day to ensure a speedy response is available for those who might present. The offer of the severe weather emergency protocols will be activated with the use of hotels, given the low numbers currently presenting. Housing Plus and the homelessness providers are mindful that people are unable to currently share rooms and facilities for the for this severe weather emergency protocol, given the COVID restrictions. So the use of hotels and the like are by far the safer option this year. We're grateful to all our providers here in Warrington. All our providers, James E House, Haven House and Museum Street, will ensure that they remain available for placements during the Christmas period, with referrals from Housing Plus. A meeting will be held with all the providers and staff from Public Health and Contracts and Commissioning the week commencing the 14th of December to confirm all protocols and arrangements are confirmed and in place. All three Commission providers are currently planning their Christmas activities for their residents and Housing Plus advise that they will be providing an out of hour service when the Council is closed. Uh, thank you, Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor Wheeler, do you have any supplementary question? Uh, not at this time, and thank you, Councillor McLaughlin, for uh, the update. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor McLaughlin. Uh, question six from Councillor Walker to Councillor Mundry. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Council, Madam, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Walker, for your question. Uh, I seem to recognise this question, so it's very similar <laughs> to one you discussed just recently. And uh, I've got a short answer, you, you'll, be, you'll be happy to know, Peter. I can confirm that discussions are ongoing between representatives of Peel Ports, who are, all, who are the owners and responsible for Warrington Swing Bridges, and council officers regarding Peel Ports' plans to refurbish and repaint each of their three 125 year old bridge swing bridges. Peel Ports have indicated they wish to undertake the work on the A49 London Road Stockton Eve Bridge first. Further to this, Peel Ports have advised that they have been through a comprehensive tender process to select a contractor to undertake these works. I can confirm that a meeting is planned in the near future between the Council and Peel Ports in order that an update can be provided on the tender process and to confirm the programme for works Peel Ports have advertised that they are looking to potentially undertake these works commencing in summer 2021. Once we have an answer to it, once we have a confirmed date and answer to these, we'll be contacting all members. Uh, I must say at this point is uh, we recognise that with the, the council have no powers, uh, uh, meaningful powers to, to enforce anything with field ports. The council, not the owners of the bridges, or have any responsibility for the maintenance. So the council have to open up negotiations to try and make improvements for the swing bridges. I did take some time to try and look at when the, Lib the Liberal and Conservative coalition were in, were in charge in Warrington to try and pick up from your formal negotiations you had with Peel Ports. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any. So the Labour administration just took it upon themselves, recognising that they don't own these bridges, will have to open negotiations with Peel Ports to try and make any benefits for the people of Stockton Heath and wider Warrington. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm pleased to announce that since the negotiations started some time ago, the swing bridge movements from a Lib Dem uh, and Conservative administration has reduced by 50%. So through negotiations with Peel Ports, we've now the swing bridge movements at peak hours has reduced from two a week to one a week. So if that's some benefit from open negotiations with people who, who uh, we need to. From the negotiations, it's led on to building up that relationship to allow, to allow us to negotiate the repainting and refurbishment of the bridges starting when we can. And, and, and I say, from a negotiation point, when you've got no control and no power over, over the end result, I think our officers, particularly uh, Steve Broomhead and the leader, leader, Labour leadership, have done a marvellous job in getting any benefits they possibly can from this process. So I'd really like to, to actually congratulate the Labour leadership and the, uh, the officers led by Stephen to getting these negotiations on the way and getting some benefits for the people of Warrington and Stockton Heath out of this in, in, entirely. So I think it's been a good, good, good process. Bear in mind is we have no control over the situation, only, only through good negotiation skills 
Michael. Thank you, Peter, for your question. Thank you, Councillor Mundry. Councillor Walker, do you have a well, supplementary question? Uh, well, like a comment, uh, 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 Madam Mayor. No, thank you for your response, Councillor Mundry. I, I appreciate the difficulties that you are under, but the disruption that will be caused will have to be managed by the Borough Council. And clearly to do that effectively, you need to be in close contact with Peel Ports and the contractor as and when that contractor is appointed. So I, I'm really merely trying to encourage you to, to, to open negotiations as soon as you possibly can when you've got that information. So thank you very much. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to respond, Madam Mayor? Uh, please, if you want to, Ms. Uh, yes, Councilor Monumentary. I think I can do it to music as well if you if you want me to. I know, I don't know where yeah. that's come from. <laughs> yes, yes, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Peter. Yes, we we, we sort of recognise that only through negotiation can we get anything. And when Peelport do need to speak to us and we do have some control over it, it is about the disruption. And that's why we wanted to make sure that the uh, the Slutches Lane at, uh, relief road is, is a way one way we can divert traffic through there. So we wanted to make sure that's completed. Uh, first before we, before the work started so we'd have somewhere to redirect some traffic at that process i think it's disruptions is inevitable it's going to happen it, it's uh, you can't do a big job like that without there being some disruption somewhere and i think we will be negotiating with peel ports the best we possibly can to mitigate against some of that disruption yeah. well, I've got it however I've got, thank you I've got, I've got thank you very much councillor mundry i'm sorry it. we're out of time but okay then thank you <laughs> no these ought to be taken as read. It's OK. Right. Question seven from Councillor Barr to Councillor Bowden. Councillor Bowden, please respond. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you to uh, Councillor Barr for the, the question. Um, I must admit, I was surprised to see this uh, question on the order papers because I don't think um, it's a matter for this council uh, whatsoever. Um, in terms of the facts that uh, are put forward in, in the question, uh, the Labour campaign for electoral reform um, has confirmed that um, 113 constituency Labour parties, I'll be very specific on that point, um, are in favour of a uh, move towards proportional representation. And an opinion survey from 2019, around the time of the last general election, um, showed a significant degree of um, members' support for proportional representation. At this stage, the Labour Party's policy is quite clear in terms of supporting uh, first past the post. But as a democratic party, um, the Labour Party does take uh, notice of its members' wishes. And in due course, through the normal process, um, it may well be that the, the party, um, as a national party, changes its position. Um, I think really this is a question that what what the question is getting at is the internal matters of the Labour Party concerning parliamentary elections. Um, and I don't think it's it's appropriate for me uh, to discuss those with Councillor Barr. Obviously, um, Councillor Barr has got the opportunity to uh, to pay his subs and to join the Labour Party if he wants to uh, in order to have a say in setting Labour Party policy. I can confirm, however, that it is a matter of public record that Warrington South constituency Labour Party um, has passed a motion um, supporting the use of proportional representation in parliamentary elections. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Barr, do you have a supplementary question? Uh, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful to Councillor Bowden. I'm, I'm grateful to the uh, message about Warrington South Constituency Labour Party. Uh, the reason that this is a question for the Council is that the Labour controlled government in Wales has, as part of its uh, adoption of proportional representation, given local authorities the opportunity to opt or decide whether they want to be proportionally represented or not. So my supplementary is, is should uh, the Labour Party get through proportional rural representation, would uh, Councillor Bowden uh, put it to uh, the people in Warrington as to whether they want a proportional, a proportional system here for our council? Councillor Bowden, please respond. Well, that's an excellent hypothetical question from Councillor <laughs> Bowden. Um, I think I think most people um, have sympathy uh, with an um, with potential changes to electoral system, which has consistently seen um, 
uh, majority parties with significant parliamentary majorities been uh, been elected on a minority of, of the national vote. I think clearly there's an issue there about um, the system. Um, however, I think most uh, certainly the, the two main, street, uh, main parties have, have held the view that first past the post has been uh, consistent in terms of delivering a strong and effective government. I, my personal view um, doesn't really come into it. I think when we come to um, to potential changes to uh, voting systems for, for local uh, elections, I think what really matters um, to people is whether or not they feel that they have a, um, a representative who understands their issues and can adequately represent them uh, at the town hall. I think, you know, any, any system which looked to have uh, a more PR based um, electoral process would need to demonstrate how people had that kind of connection because quite often and you know I think the vast majority of members on this council currently you know live in or close to um, the wards that they represent and I think you know there is a question there for the people of Warrington and for us as a council about about that adequacy of representation and that field of connection and understanding of issues however clearly if uh, you know, as we all wish, uh, we end up with a, a Labour government in Westminster um, and and that's, uh, you know, supporting a move towards proportional representation and that e extends to consultation on local government as well, then we'd take that on board and put it to the to the people of Warrington. Um, but I, I'm, I'm really pleased that Bob, like me and uh, many on this uh, on this council, look forward to a Labour government um, mm -hmm. in, in the near future. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you very Thank much, Tazabo. <laughs> Thank you. Um, question eight from Councillor Marks to Councillor Mitchell. Uh, can Councillor Mitchell please respond? Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Marks, for the question. The first important point here is why do we invest at all? Well, it's because the Conservative government has made the political choice of austerity. Over the last De decade, it slashed funding for local government, taking out 60 pence in every pound. The bulk of the council's money is spent on adult social care and on children at risk. That's about 80%. So if the council simply passed on those cuts, you can see that the most severely affected people would be the most vulnerable people, those in most need of our help and care. This Labour administration wasn't sim prepared to simply pass on those funding cuts to residents and has done everything that it can to protect the people of Warrington from them. It's against the law to borrow money or use money from selling property to pay for services. You can only use income. You can borrow money to invest in property, which in turn produces an income and you can use that income to pay for services. That's why we invest. The vast majority of our investments are in bricks and mortar, that is properties with long leases, which gives us an income after all of the costs of borrowing, looking after the property, etc. are taken out. The value of the assets that we hold is significantly greater than the debt that the council has, and that includes debt for historic stuff as well, such as regeneration projects from a long time ago. It's certainly not all from investments. Nevertheless, we could pay off all that debt if we sold the assets. But the assets produce an income of £20 million every year. We'd no longer receive that if we sold the assets. That would lead to cuts to services, especially to the most vulnerable people in the town. And I'm assuming that that's what the town's Conservative MP is proposing that we do. Some other investments have other objectives aside from providing income even though most do or will do. For example, Redwood Bank brought, brought lending for businesses to Warrington when other banks wouldn't lend to small and medium businesses. Together Energy is a growing company which will provide green energy to Warrington residents and will help the council to tackle fuel poverty. The council's financial reports, that is capital, treasury and revenue, contain details of the current details of existing schemes and to request approvals for any variance to schemes when it's needed. Any new schemes that need approval are discussed at Treasury Management Board, 
which all parties are represented at before they're even presented for approval to cabinet. The cabinet reports detail costs, risks and the extensive due diligence that's undertaken. And we've had recent schemes of this nature and the high value have been supported by risk workshops attended by cross party members from across the council, officers and external advisors. The council endeavours to continuously improve the information contained within its reports in response to requests for more detail being available. That needs to be balanced against protecting commercial interests that are involved with these investments, where release of that in information may have an adverse commercial impact for the businesses involved. PricewaterhouseCooper have recently conducted a review of governance of the schemes and the final report and action plan is due to be presented to Audit and Corporate Governance Committee in January, which aims to support further improvements around the Council's governance and reporting of these investments as required. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Councillor Marks. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Um, we're out of time and we need okay. to. We have quite a bit of. Is that all right, Councillor Marks? I have to say yes. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry we can't take any more questions on that and we will go to item 10 motions please. Motion one, climate and ecological emergency bill. Councillor Barr please propose. Councillor Marks please second. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I will propose in just a brief speech because members have had the opportunity to read the papers and most of the argument is in the preamble to the motion and the motion itself. I, I'm pleased to propose the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill motion. Uh, I need to add little to the explanation in the papers. The objective of the bill before Parliament and of this motion is to demonstrate the United Kingdom's and Warrington Council's determination to fight climate change and the ecological crisis by both reducing carbon emissions and acting to improve ecologies to increase biodiversity and capture more carbon. On national league tables, Warrington has always suffered by being the home of Fiddler's Ferry and having the CO2 emissions of the power station counted as the town's output rather than that of places that use the power that was generated. But we mustn't treat the closure of Fiddler's Ferry as job done on CO2 for Warrington. Our welcome investments in solar power, wherever the opportunity has arisen in Warrington and elsewhere, have also shown a welcome commitment to clean energy and reducing the CO2 for which Warrington is responsible. However, these technical and accounting fixes don't directly benefit Warrington residents who want cleaner air, more diverse, more biodiverse green spaces and a better managed green belt around their own town. Warrington has a sad legacy of having been the dumping ground of the north of England. We have very many sites that still require remediation and too much of the 66% of the lands of Greenbelt in Warrington is poor quality. We've seen the appetite of Warrington residents to invest in green projects. I was pleasantly surprised by the success of the Warrington Municipal Investment to finance some of our solar uh, investments, despite the relatively low rates of return. The fact that we were able to raise a million pounds in that way is very impressive. Uh, but we also know that there's a great appetite among Warrington residents to do other things for environment. They will turn out for litter picks, they'll plant trees, they'll look after allotments. So the purpose of this motion is to reaffirm our commitment to help Warrington residents help themselves by, by improving our green spaces and ecology and uh, to uh, encourage uh, our MPs to ensure that Britain fulfils its commitments, which is going to state at the Climate Change Summit next year, uh, to improving and dealing with the ecological crisis as well as the climate emergency internationally and on a global scale. So I commend this motion to the Council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Barr. Councillor Marks, please second. Um, yes, I'd like to second this motion and say a few words as well. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank now, you. as the motion states, this Council does, has done much to promote action to, to tackle climate change. In fact, I'm very proud of the fact that when I was leader back in February 2007, we signed the Nottingham Declaration, which was a voluntary pledge by local authorities uh, to become greener. In fact, my colleague, 
and my colleague um, Councillor Graham Wellborn, who unfortunately isn't here tonight, who was the executive board member for Safe and Greener Community, was quoted in the Warrington Guardian as saying, and I quote from that paper, signing this declaration shows how committed we are as a local authority to reducing the effects of climate change. And the Guardian also said that councillors put their political differences aside to support it. So I hope the same happens tonight. Now, the purpose of this motion is to take us further forwards and brings in the ecological dimension. Despite massive issues like COVID and Brexit, environmental issues are still very much in the news. And let me just remind you of some of the stories in the press just this last week. I mean, today we learned that snowy winters in the UK could become a thing of the past in the future. Uh, today we also learned that a combination of beer and crisps will help tackle CO2 emissions. This may be lighthearted, but there is actually a serious side to it. A few days ago, there was a story about a trillion ton iceberg, three times the size of Greater London, heading towards a remote island in the South Atlantic. And last week, there was another headline in my paper saying 2020 is on track to be the second hottest year ever. Now, the UN Secretary General said in a speech at Columbia University in New York that humanity is waging war on nature. This is suicidal. He also said that natural disasters relating to climate change cost the world $150 billion last year and air and water pollution are killing 9 million people annually. Another headline from last week said the crown jewels of England's natural environment are in a shocking state. Because only a quarter of the sites of special scientific interest in our national parks are in a good condition, according to Natural England. Now, Natural England is the government body responsible for monitoring and protecting them, which has seen its budget fall by 60% since 2008. And this cut has been criticised by a professor who specialises in ecology and conservation at the University of Sussex, who says our government has slashed budgets for protecting our most precious possession, our environment. These figures are shocking and should be a wake up call. Now, the bill has a cross party support from 85 MPs from seven different parties, including Labour members. So I hope it gains your this motion gains your support tonight. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Marks. Um, do any other members wish to speak to this matter? I believe um, Councillor Guthrie has said that she would like to speak. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, for this op opportunity to speak to this motion. I think what Councillor Barr said at first, climate change is everyone's responsibility. It's not just the council's. And I think an over provision of council requirements is not the right way forward. We need to liaise with our residents to help them understand the danger and risk to human life that climate change poses. And there's actually a program on tonight um, that I hope everybody's recorded, which talks about sort of greater heat uh, within the world. Um, the motion is based on the Climate and Eco Ecology Emergency Bill and is seeking support from councils and MPs. No Conservative MPs to date have, supposed, have supported this private members bill, to my knowledge anyway. So it's time for our own Andy Carter to step up. In fact, the government recently took out the target for new gas boilers uh, to be sold with no target date set. This was set in the Paris Agreement. Um, so we've no targets for that anymore. Uh, and I'm not too sure about the government's commitment to this. As a local authority, we acknowledge that we have an important role in delivering carbon reductions throughout our borough. In June 2019, we declared our climate emergency um, declaration and have set out delivering its net zero carbon targets by 2030. We should be proud that we were one of the first councils to do this. We've established a climate change commission with two independent local advocates to lead it. Um, Lewis Groke is our deputy chair and is part of a group of young people who have formed a climate change emergency youth forum. This group, group is actively seeking views of young people which will, which will empower schools and create positive climate change action, which we should welcome. We started our journey um, in 2011 by starting to update all our streetlights to LEDs. Um, 18,000 have now been completed, saving us £330,000 um, per year in energy costs. 
We've placed solar PV installations onto our social housing, helping residents with fuel poverty and generating, generating 4,127 megawatts of power by saving over five, 540,000 and reducing CO2 emissions by 928 tonnes. We own two solar farms with another on the way. They're like babies, they grow. These solar assets will allow us to supply virtually all our power needs as a council, meaning that our own electricity use will be zero carbon. Any extra electricity will be purchased from renewable sources, for example, Together Energy, in which the council has invested. Plus, the sale of surplus power will generate an income to the council for a generation to come. We have also looked beyond energy use in buildings to address our carbon emissions. We've invested in our fleet, choosing the most efficient vehicles we can purchase at the moment. Uh, we've got a new car park in the centre of town. We've got 58 charging points. We've also published planning guidance that requires all new developments, both residential and commercial, to provide accessible electric charging points. We also thank the businesses in our town that have been thoughtful in installing charge points, enabling uh, visitors to their shops and sites to be able to charge when necessary. We have recently started the, st started the rollout of carbon literacy training and will eventually make this accessible for all our employees as well as council members. So watch this space. Our ability to connect with our residents is of paramount importance and we are seeking a meaningful way of engaging. We hope to start the first engagement survey in January to find out what people actually want in our climate change emergency. It will not be just seeking the seeking of views, but an education tool to help all members of our, our town understand more about climate change. We are already planning to roll this out on a cost neutral basis. It's sad, but a lot of people know a lot about climate change. But if you talk to actual residents in the borough, sadly, their knowledge uh, isn't isn't what uh, we would like. So we want to make we want to make sure that people understand what climate change means to them. In terms of transport, we hope in the future to have an all electric bus fleet. Um, with us recently securing funding via the town deal for a new bus depot, which would be electric ready. And we are promoting active travel and further creating places where walking and cycling are the natural choices. As for the natural environment, it's great you have put this into your motion as the natural environment environment plays a key role in making our boroughs safe for both young people and our wildlife. Um, in order to mitigate any adverse effects of climate change on our natural environment, we looked we look to work, be working with the Mersey Forest to develop land use and hopefully to be able to plant trees. Um, we want to develop bids for carbon sequestration, particularly in Risley Moss and peatland areas. We want to carry out land searches for potential new forest areas to help negate the issue of people planting trees in the wrong places. We have had people planting trees because of their their wish to make things greener. We've had them been having them planted trees over gas mains, which are not the right place to be. So we want to make sure they plant them in the right places. Excuse uh, me, Mr. Guthrie. Um, yeah. We're getting out of time now. I'm awfully sorry. <laughs> okay. Can you finish there? Are you all right to finish there? Just just one one little thing. Your the idea of getting MPs involved, and we fully support your. Uh, support your right into them to get them involved. At a, meet, a meeting of our of our commission uh, of our uh, green commission today, our commission chair is also writing to both our MPs to get them involved. And I fully support your motion. Thank, Thank you, you Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Guthrie. Um, can we go to straight to the vote, please? Chief Executive will now take the vote. Do you want Councillor Bar to come in? Yeah. Okay. Uh, before we do, Councillor Bar, would you like to come back?
I'd just like to thank Councillor Guthrie very much indeed for her very supportive speech. Uh, I agree with all of it and I think that she put the council's record very well. Uh, I do hope that we can get cross council support uh, for this motion tonight. So I'm happy to move straight to the vote. Thank you, Councillor Barr. So members, moving to the vote on this particular motion. Um, for against or abstain. Start with Councillor Abbey, please. Four. Thank you. Councillor Axel. Four. Councillor Barr. Four. Councillor Bate. Four. Councillor Biggin. Four. Councillor Bowden. Four. Councillor Buckley. Four. Councillor Carey. Four. Councillor Carter. Four. Councillor Cooksey. Councillor Cregan. Four. Councillor Jaria. Four. Councillor Fellows. Four. Councillor Fitzsimmons. Councillor Flarty. Four. Councillor Fragley. Four. Councillor Friend. Diana Friend, four. Sorry, Diana. Councillor Graham Friend. Four. Councillor Frogger. Councillor Grime. Four. Councillor Guthrie. Four. Councillor Hall. Four. Councillor Hannon. Councillor Harris. Four. Councillor Hart. Four. Councillor Higgins. Four. Councillor Hill. Four. Councillor Jennings. Four. Councillor Johnson. Four. Councillor Keane. Four. Thank you. Councillor Kerr Brown. Four. Councillor King. Four. Councillor Knowles. Four. <coughs> Councillor Marks. Four. Councillor McCarthy. Four. Councillor McLaughlin. Four. Councillor Mitchell. Four. Councillor Morgan. Four. Councillor Morris. Four. Councillor Hans Mundry. Four. Councillor Cara Mundry. Four. Councillor Parrish. Four. Councillor Price. Councillor Smith. Four. Councillor Tarr. Four. Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Warburton. Four. Councillor Wheeler. Four. Councillor Williams. Four. Councillor Pat Wright. Four. And Councillor Steve Wright. Four. Thank you, Madam Thank you. Um, I declare the motion carried. Uh, motion two. Council Parish, please propose. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, can I say at the outset, we've decided to accept the amendment. Uh, it's not quite on the same topic, but it's obviously not unrelated. Uh, I do appreciate that a £20 increase in carers allowance is Lib Dem policy, uh, but Labour also proposes an increase, so we'll not quibble over that. It is the Christmas season. Uh, so I believe that to amend the motion, we'll need the consent of the Council. I hope that doesn't need a name vote. Um, it is an altered motion, so do I have the council's consent to continue in this way? Aye. Aye. Yes. 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 Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody Agreed. happy? Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very yeah. much. <laughs> thank you. Um, do you want to carry on, Councillor? Um, yes, thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Parish. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Um, one of the annoyances uh, of life for me is the BBC's balance or maybe fear of retribution for the government. You just know that if you get a, a local councillor or a, a chief executive or even a conservative chair of the local government's association saying that this or that service is underfunded and councillors will have to make cuts, uh, the next put up a government source who will be quoted to say how many billions councils have had. Often it's the same billions having to do a lot of work to cover the uh, lots of different services. Even when their own councils go bust, it doesn't seem to ring alarm bells. 
unless it's to find some miraculous extra little money tree for that Conservative Council. But every council knows that the numbers uh, stack up, don't stack up for the social care budget. Some describe it as a, a black hole, a perfect storm, and as the government cuts central funding for councils and the costs of social care go up as the population ages, eventually spending on care would exceed income and all of the services would then be under threat. Uh, then I recall, I was trying hard to remember what it was, it was what Barnet Council called this eight years ago, the graph of doom. In a few years, the cost of adult care and children's services would outstrip income. I think some say it was exaggerated and allowing councils to increase council tax has slightly eased the time scale, obviously at the cost of uh, local residents paying more council tax. But an article by the economic editor of the Financial Times two years ago reckoned that spending on old age, health, education, welfare and debt interest was set to rise starting in two years time. In other words, now from 26 percent of GDP now to 44 percent in, if you can think that far ahead, 2067 was the date he set. And, and that was before Covid and before the expected negative impact on gross domestic product of Brexit. His conclusion was that this next 20 years is no time for the politics of read my lips, no new taxes. He said we must be sufficiently mature to be able to discuss the need to raise everyone's taxes and to talk about fair burden sharing. The government has been promising social care reform since they were elected with the Liberal Democrats in 2010. The coalition government did promote the Dilnot Commission, which led to the Care Act, but austerity meant that the fine intentions have been accompanied by a 40% cut in real term spending in financial support to local councils delivering social care. Uh, Madam Merck, Councillor Knowles, and I think Councillor Mitchell also wants to speak, and they'll provide some more detail. I move the motion. Thank you very much, Councillor Parrish. Um, Councillor Knowles, would, do you wish to speak? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to second the motion and, uh, and to speak to it. It's never been clearer that social care requires reform and central to the reform is the need to fund correctly the services that care for the country's most vulnerable people. Since Covid, awareness of the importance of social care for both adults and children has never been higher. The tremendous value to society of the people who provide both paid and unpaid care with such great skill, dedication and compassion has been acknowledged, but this esteem is not matched by realistic investment into the system they serve. Covid has magnified and exposed challenges that have faced social care for more than a decade. Councils are at the front line of ensuring that people are safeguarded, but face many hurdles in delivering services due to a range of factors such as the use of short term and time limited funding settlements to support budgets, including the improved Better Care Fund, fragile care markets, increasing demographic pressures, increasing levels of unmet and undermet need, insufficient resources to invest in early intervention and prevention in a meaningful way, and recruitment and retention issues with the workforce. According to the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services, £7.7 .7 billion of savings have been made to the adult social care budget over the last 10 years, with um, £608 million of planned further cuts to budgets for 2020 to 2021 which are now no longer realistically deliverable due to the impact of COVID. The government told councils to do whatever it takes, and we did, but they've not come good on their promise to fund that essential response. We're at the end of the road. At a local level in Warrington, the relationship between the NHS and the council quickly found a new normal in COVID, and this shows us the way for the future. Rapid discharge arrangements, joint decision-making processes, more integrated working on the front line are all developing at pace. The council, the NHS and our voluntary and third sector work in ever more cooperative ways to make the most of scant resources. This works described in more detail in my current and previous portfolio updates. Lots is being done here to ensure that we're efficient and effective, making the very most of the local spend to deliver the best outcomes possible. 
I want to place on record my thanks and admiration to everyone in Warrington's partnership who works with such commitment and energy. That includes all the unpaid carers referred to in the amendment to the motion, who've been under incredible pressure these past months and who deserve all the support we can give them. As a member of the Carers Partnership Board, I'm committed to taking their needs seriously and really valuing what they do. After all, many of us will be carers in our lifetime and we're also likely to become the cared for. It's done with love, but that doesn't mean caring is work without emotional or financial cost. We need a public conversation about social care reform and it needs to be a grown up, realistic conversation that properly squares up to the fact that more cannot be delivered with less if we do not want people and communities to fall between the cracks. If this doesn't happen and soon, this council and others like us up and down the land of all colours of political leadership are on hiding to nothing. Locally integrated care built around individual people should be the norm. Councils can do the detail at a person centred level and they understand what will work best for the communities they serve. The care market in this country is broken and needs a complete review. One of the biggest difficulties in COVID has been the complexity and the structure of our care provision, which spans across some 58,000 providers. We must address existing and historical inequalities, ensuring that the care you receive when you need it is not a postcode lottery or based on unfairness that has become entrenched over time. Again, COVID has revealed the gaps and all the talk of levelling up will be nothing more than hot air if the funding does not follow. Here are some statements from ADAS on which I think we'd all agree. Good quality housing and accommodation is central to care and to our lives. We need a social workforce strategy. I'm really thrilled to see a health and social care academy as part of our town deal. We must prioritise access to technological and digital solutions. Again, Warrington's committed to developing this area of its economy. We need a cross government strategy. We need a managed and funded transition pending proper long term funding. All of these require long term sustained investment. We have to face up to this now. The issue is much bigger than the response to COVID and it's urgent. Social care already accounts for around 80% of this council's budget and the need is not diminishing. The local authority has many other responsibilities and provides many other services that are important to everyone who lives and works here. But social care is a statutory duty that must never be shirked. We've been starved of cash by central government for ideological reasons, but people's eyes have now been opened. We can't clap for carers and then ignore them. We can't Council pay our knows. respects. We're I'm nearly, nearly done. out of time. Thank Thanks. you. We can't pay our respects for the care and compassion that our carers provide and then expect to get something for nothing. Now is the time to inject realistic sustained funding and to legislate for a care system that really works. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knowles. Uh, please can I invite Councillor Wheeler to propose the amendment and yeah, oh, to speak to thank, the motion. Thank you. Thank sorry, you, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> thank you, sorry, thank you, Judith. <laughs> right, okay. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillors Parish and Knowles, for the motion, which I'm sure the Lib Dem group will support. And thank you for agreeing to accept the um, the amendment. Um, there are an estimated 900,000 full-time carers in this country. Some are young, some elderly, and many are of working age who give up work to care for friends and relatives. They do a remarkable and important job in very di difficult circumstances, challenges and struggles on a daily basis. Life has got harder for most during the pandemics as day centres have been shut and respite care curtailed. Many carers have been unable to take a break, even for brief periods. And I believe Carers UK have found that 81% of carers have had to take on more care since the pandemic. Carers need to look after their own mental and physical health to, to stay strong for their loved ones. A hard job has got even harder. Many are now exhausted and many are worried how they will cope over the winter. And if this was not hard enough, many carers face extreme financial hardship. They rely on a carer's allowance of only £67, 25p a week. This makes it the lowest benefit of its kind. Another example of how carers are often, too often an afterthought for many politicians. 
Carers UK estimate that 530 million is saved every day by carers, care that otherwise has to be provided by the overstretched, underfunded, underestimated and over, often overlooked residential and domiciliary care sectors. We ask that the Council resolve to ask both Warrington MPs that the Government raises the carer's allowance to a thousand a year, the same as the uplift for universal credit, and acknowledges their contribution in the, in the provision of adult social care, care. We must do far more to support, support our wonderful carers. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wheeler. Councillor Walker, do you wish to speak? No, 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 I don't, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, but obviously, you. I'm pleased that the amendment has been added to the motion. Yes, good. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Parrish, you have the right to reply. Uh, Madam Mayor, I think Councillor Mitchell wanted to speak as well, please. Could I speak, Madam Mayor? Yes, you can, Councillor Mitchell. Thank you. Uh, so local councils provide adult social care, that's care for anyone over 18 who needs extra help. Just to give an idea of scale, councils in England receive 1.8 million new requests for adult social care per year. That's about 5,000 per day. We're all likely to be touched by social care at some point in our lives. As a growing and ageing population, the number of people needing social care is growing but the costs of providing social care keep rising. The current system is at breaking point. And as I said earlier, the councils have been underfunded by government over the last decade, losing 60 pence in the pound under the Conservatives policies. With adult social care taking up 41% of the council's budget, that plus childcare expenses, um, children at risk takes it to 80% of the budget. You can see how important social care is when, and, and how impacted it is by Tory cuts. Cuts affects the council's ability to care for and support, support the most vulnerable people in the town and the low paid or unpaid carers who do such an incredible job. Long term, long -term reform is needed, but the government's dragged the feet and we're still waiting for the green paper, which would at least start off consultation about how to tackle this issue. We've recently had the spending review where some new funding was announced. A lot of this new funding will come from increased council tax, though. The funding will address some short term problems, but it's a sticking plaster and it won't help in the long term. The government is also short sighted in not providing any new public health funding. Public health addresses health inequalities, keeping people healthy and well reduces the numbers needing social care and the NHS. So we've seen through the crisis the crucial value of adult social care services. Our carers are on the front line. It's now time to fund those services properly. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Thank you. Councillor Mitchell. Uh, Madam Mayor. Yes. Can I just say a few words on the original motion? Councillor Marks. You can. Come in, Councillor Marks. Yeah, just to confirm that the Liberal Democrats will be supporting this, uh, as you'd expect us to. Yes. It also seems that only £300 million appears to be genuinely, genuinely new grant funding from the government. And this is both for adult and children's social care. And as Councillor Mitchell quite rightly says, the, the social care precinct is paid for by Warrington residents. It raised different sums in different parts of the country and it's unrelated to need. And the one year deal we've got from the government provides none of the certainty desperately needed to properly plan ahead. And it makes it very difficult for the NHS and local government um, to jointly improve health outcomes, reduce health inequalities and increase well-being. And again, as Councillor Mitchell said, I too have lost track of how many times the, the government has promised to fix social care. Um, we've got to stop this approach. We need properly funded reform now, not tomorrow. Thank you, Adam Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Marks. Uh, can I, uh, I will now ask the Chief Executive to take a vote no. on the altered notion. Excuse Sorry. me, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Um, yes. I apologise, it's Joan Grime. Yes, um, Joan. I didn't realise, but I think I should declare an interest and not vote. On right, this we motion. are, Joan, that's Thank fine. You. Thank you, Joan. Sorry, I didn't realise sooner. No, quite all right. Could I just add a point? 
Oh, um, Councillor Warburton. Um, yes, Councillor Warburton. Um, it is in the Conservative manifesto and before the last election, um, Boris Johnson um, pledged that he would tackle social care and source out social care within 100 days of his election. And clearly he's not done that. And that's another promise of the Conservative Party and this, this Prime Minister. Thank you for that, Councillor Warburton. Madam Mayor, um, Councillor Johnson, um, I think I should declare as well as somebody that works within the social care sector and I won't take the vote. Oh, thank you, Councillor Johnson. Madam Mayor, Steve Parrish, um, I'm not quite sure whether members are declaring because they work in the sector or because they know somebody who gets carer's allowance. Um, we're not voting to increase carer's allowance, we're asking the government to do it, so I'm not quite sure whether they need to declare an interest in those circumstances because there's so many people we know getting it. Uh, it's one of those things like, you know, putting up council tax where you can't entirely have uh, devolve it to somebody else. Uh, yes. Councillor what, Madam Mayor? Fine, thank you. Ma Madam Mayor, can I ask, in, in that case, are we able to take the vote or not? Yes, I'm hoping sorry. to be able to sum up briefly. Yes, yes, you can. Okay. Thank you. Oh, councillors, you can take the vote. Thank you. Madam Mayor, can I sum up briefly? You can, Councillor Parrish. Oh, thank you. I mean, the. Um, we, I think we... It sounded like a, an all-out attack by two parties on another one, but uh, earlier in the uh, earlier on, I did take in vain the name of the chair of the local government association. Um, so actually, I didn't I didn't name him, but it's actually the councillor James Jameson, who's the Conservative leader of Central Bedfordshire Council. And if I may, I'll, I will sum up with with his words. Uh, For too long, we've been promised a plan to fix the social care crisis. But people who use and work in these vital services are still waiting. The COVID-19 crisis has proved that we need a complete reset, not a restart, when it comes to the future of social care. Everyone who has been involved in dealing with the dreadful effects of COVID deserves to know that the lessons learned will be used in shaping the future. This should mean care and support is properly based around every individual, keeping them safe, well and as independent as possible, and in their own home and community for as long as possible. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Parrish. Sorry, somebody else. Yes? Yes. Please do. Hello. 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 Could you hear that? Let me just. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah it's just for clarity, from for those members who are concerned that they may have an interest, uh, if you have um, an employment or a shareholding or something of that nature, which is on your um, de declaration of pecuniary interest. Uh, and that is directly affected by this uh, this vote, then you should uh, withdraw from the meeting and not take part. Uh, but uh, if that isn't the case, then obviously you're free to uh, um, to take part uh, unless you um, feel you, that you have um, a non-pecuniary interest, which you can stay in the meeting, but uh, you may feel you don't want to take part, but you but you are free to do so. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, so, yeah. All right, members, moving to the vote then, please. Um, uh, for, against, or abstain, please. Go, Councillor Abbey. For. Thank you. Councillor Axel. For. Councillor Bar. For. Councillor Bates. For. Councillor Biggin. For. Councillor Bowden. For. Councillor Buckley. For. Councillor Carey. For. Councillor Carter. For. Councillor Cregan. For. Councillor Duria. For. Councillor Fellows. For. Councillor Fitzsimmons. Councillor Farty. For. Councillor Fresley. For. Councillor Diane Friend. 
Four. Councillor Graham, friend. Four. Councillor Grime. Not voting. Thank you. Councillor Guthrie. Right. Four. Councillor Hall. Four. Councillor Hannon. Four. Councillor Harris. Four. Councillor Hart. Four. Councillor Higgins. Four. Councillor Hill. Four. Councillor Jennings. Four. Councillor Johnson. Not voting. Thanks, Wendy. Councillor Keane. Four. Councillor Kerr Brown. Four. Councillor King. Four. Councillor Knowles. Four. Four. Councillor Marks. Four. Councillor McCarthy. Four. Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor Mitchell. Four. Councillor Morgan. Four. Councillor Morris. Four. Councillor Mundry. Four. Councillor Karen Mundry. Four. Councillor Parrish. Four. Councillor Matt Smith. Four. Councillor Tart. Four. Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Warburton. Four. Councillor Wheeler. Four. Councillor Williams. Four. Councillor Pat Wright. Four. And Councillor Steve Wright. Four. Thank you, members. I declare the motion carried. Thank you. Uh, we're going now to item 11, and it's the council request for extended leave of absence and appointment of committee places. Councillor Bowden, can you propose the report? And Councillor Mitchell, can you second, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this report is fairly uh, straightforward. Uh, it seeks um, an extension to dispensation for two of our members uh, on the grounds of ill health um, and also uh, makes um, some appointments to committee places as shown in section 3.4 um, to cover changes from uh, the appointment of Councillor Jennings to the Cabinet and other vacancies that we didn't fill at our annual meeting. So I'll move the recommendations in uh, paragraph 9.1. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bowden. Councillor Mitchell. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I second this report. Thank you. Do any members wish to speak on the report? Please indicate. No. Chief Executive. Taking the vote again. Yep. Thank you, Second members. Right. On this report, please, Councillor Abbey. Councillor Axel. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Alex. Councillor Axel. Councillor Barr. Four. Councillor Bate. Four. Councillor Bean. Four. Councillor Bowen. Four. Councillor Buckley. Four. Councillor Carey. Four. Councillor Carter. Four. Councillor Cregan. Four. Councillor Jarea. Four. Councillor Fellows. Four. Councillor Fitzsimmons. <coughs> Councillor Farty. Four. Councillor Fragley. Four. Councillor Diane Friend. Four. Councillor Graham Friend. Four. Councillor Grime. Four. Councillor Guthrie. Four. Councillor Hall. Four. Councillor Hannon. Four. Councillor Harris. Four. Councillor Hart. Four. Higgins. Four. Councillor Hill. Four. Councillor Jennings. Four. Councillor Johnson. Four. Councillor Keane. Four. Councillor Kerr Brown. Four. Councillor King. Four. 
Councillor Knowles? Four. Councillor Marks? Four. Councillor McCarthy? Four. Councillor McLaughlin? Yes, I'd like to record four for this vote and the previous vote, which I um, lost the connection for, please. Thank you, Maureen. We have that. Councillor Mitchell? Four. Councillor Morgan? Four. Councillor Morris? Four. And Councillor Mundry? Four. Councillor Karen Mundry? Four. Councillor Parrish? Four. Councillor Matt Smith? Four. Councillor Tart? Four. Councillor Walker? Four. Councillor Warburton? Four. Councillor Wheeler? Four. Councillor Tony Williams? Four. Councillor Pat Wright? Four. And Councillor Steve Wright? Four. Thank you, members. Thank you. The motion has been carried. Thank you very much. The meeting is now concluded. May I wish you a peaceful Christmas and a happy and healthy New Year. Please keep safe and keep well. Thank, thank you. you, Madam Mayor. Thank, 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 thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good night. Thank you.